I'm uh, Elder Stephen Snow, the uh, church historian and recorder, and it's my privilege to conduct, and later I'll introduce our speaker, uh, President Dieter F. Uchtdorf, and his wife, uh, Sister Harriet Uchtdorf, who are special guests and seated on the stand. Also uh, pleased to have my wife, uh, Sister Phyllis Snow, on the stand. Reed Nielsen, the managing director of the church history department. Brent Topp, dean of religious education at Brigham Young University. And Richard Bennett, department chair of church history and doctrine in BYU. This symposium, as you know, is jointly co-sponsored by BYU and church history department. And we're very, very grateful for this opportunity to gather. We're, we'd like to especially recognize as well President Uchtdorf's family who are seated, seated here in the front of the auditorium along with Sister Burton of the General Relief Society Presidency and uh, we're, we welcome her as well. And also uh, members of the Relief Society General Board that are in attendance. We also welcome those presenters who have added so much to our uh, symposium uh, this weekend, as well as the scholars, the BYU professors and students, the church history department uh, employees and missionaries, and the local press representatives, as well as interested members uh, of the public. Thank you for coming. We'll begin uh, this morning by, with a special, uh, uh, with an invocation, first of all, from Stephen C. Harper of the church history department. And then we'll have a special musical number from the International Children's Choir, who'll perform a medley of songs from around the world. And following their number, I'll introduce our speaker. Heavenly Father, we're grateful for this opportunity to gather for this church history symposium. We're thankful for the many uh, people who've worked to prepare and put it on for us. We're grateful, especially this morning, to have President Uchtdorf here to speak to us. And we ask you to bless him as he does so, that uh, he may be able to have uh, the power to convey the message he desires to do, and that we might receive it by the Spirit. We give thee thanks for the history of this church, Father. We thank thee for restoring it in the latter days. We thank thee for thy son and his atoning sacrifice. We're grateful for the commission to take the gospel to all the world and pray that thou will strengthen and enable us in our efforts to do so. And uh, we pray for thy divine guidance in all we do and say and think. And we say these things humbly in the name of Jesus Christ, amen.
Thank you very much. That was very nice. This morning, we are honored to have as the speaker of our key uh, keynote address, President Dieter F. Uchtdorf, second counselor in the First Presidency of the Church. He is uniquely qualified to address this symposium with, his emphasis, with its emphasis on the international church. In his professional life and now his ecclesiastical life, he has traveled the world and brings a unique perspective to his calling. While Americans, Englishmen, Canadians, a Scotsman, and even an Irishman have served in the First Presidency, President Uke joins Anthon Lund, a Dane, as one of the only two brethren who've served in the First Presidency from continental Europe. I, like you, enjoy his clear prophetic instruction. As a former German missionary, struggling to understand and speak his language, I marvel at the mastery, uh, his mastery of mine. He is both a student of the gospel as well as a student of language. President Uchtdorf was born on the 6th of November 1940 in Ostrava, Czechoslovakia, to Karl Albert and Hilgard Opelt Uchtdorf. And as a result of his grandmother's encounter with a member of the LDS church in a, church in a soup line, his family later joined the church in 1947. They fled to Frankfurt Mine in 1952, where he received an education in engineering. And in 1959, he joined the German Air Force and served for six years as a jet fighter pilot. In 1965, President Nukdorf began working for Lufthansa, the German Airlines, as a pilot. From 1970 until 1996, he flew as captain of the Boeing 737, the Airbus, the DC-10, and finally the Boeing 747. While also working as a training and check captain, he received several management responsibilities. These positions included section chief for the Boeing 737, head of Lufthansa Pilot School in Arizona, head of all cockpit crews, and finally senior vice president of flight operations and Lufthansa chief pilot. He was also chairman of the Flight Operations Committee of the International Transport Association. President Uchtdorf was called as a second counselor in the First Presidency of the Church of Latter-day Saints on the 3rd of February, 2008. He was sustained as a member of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles on, on the 2nd of October, 2004, and he served as a general authority since April, 1994. Dieter Uchtdorf and Harriet Reich Uchtdorf married in 1962. They have two children, six grandchildren, and believe it or not, one great-grandchild. With his call as an apostle, the Uchtdorfs left their homeland and now live permanently in the United States. President Sister Uchtdorf enjoy outdoor activities, cherish the arts, and are happiest when spending time with their family. President. Thank you, Alice Snow. It's such a privilege and joy to be with you today, especially with, with Harriet. She's uh, such a wonderful lady. I call her the sunshine in my life. And it's uh, wonderful to be here with the love of my life and to speak about um, the light of my life, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's, of course, wonderful to be with you. And thank you to this uh, beautiful children choir. Uh, they, are, they represent, actually, the topic you have here on your church history symposium, the worldwide church, the global reach of Mormonism. And they represented it in such a great and wonderful way. I even recognized there was a little Czech uh, hymn in there, among the others, even though my Czech is not present anymore. But uh, it's wonderful to see the international church, how it reaches out all around the globe. Now, um, it's a privilege indeed to be with you today. And when I received the invitation to participate in this symposium, I felt like it was something very close to my heart. I'm not um, entirely sure of all the reasons why, but I do know this. History is important. And uh, keeping ourselves anchored to the lessons learned from history will enable us to emulate the best of what it means 
to be human. It can also help us avoid the worst. George Wilhelm or Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, as we say in German, the German philosopher and idealist said, we learn from history that we do not learn from history, <laughs> which is supported by George Santayanas, uh, who said, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. The late novelist uh, Michael uh, Crichton is reported to have said, if you don't know history, then you don't know anything. You are a leaf that doesn't know it is part of a tree. History teaches us not only about the leaves of existence, it also teaches us about the twigs, the branches, the trunks, and the roots of life. And these lessons are certainly important. One of the weaknesses we have as mortals is to assume that our leaf is all there is. And you find this often in other people. But I think if we look into the mirror, we find it even in our own perceptions. It is um, that our experience encompasses everyone else's that our truth is complete and universal. As I considered what I wanted to speak about today, it seemed that the metaphor of the leaf needed to be at the heart. But I also ran across an old Yiddish expression that goes to a warm, in horseradish, the world is horseradish. So I want to emphasize that the truth embraced by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints extends beyond leaves of any size, and certainly beyond horseradish. It extends beyond time and space and encompasses all truth, the mysteries of the tiniest atoms to the vast and incomprehensible secrets that the universe holds so tantalizingly before us. The gospel of Jesus Christ encompasses not only the truth of what was and what is, but the truth of what can and will be. It is the most practical of all truths. It teaches the way of the disciple, a path that can take ordinary flawed mortals and transform them into glorious, immortal, and limitless beings whose divine potential is beyond our meager capacity to imagine. Now, that is practical truth. It is priceless beyond imagination. It is truth of the highest order. The Pursue, discovery, and application of truth are what we are on this earth to discover. And you are part of this process because you are scholars, you are interested in this field. And I very much appreciate, of course, the questions you presented um, to me as I asked for them. Um, and um, I decided not to do the question and answer period after my remarks, but I try to embed the answers to most of the questions right in my remarks, and I hope you will recognize them when you, when you see them. Now let me come back to the core of my remarks, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ is not only encompasses, encompassing all truth, but it specializes in the knowledge that will be of greatest worth to us in this life and throughout the eternities to come. So it reaches way out into the future. And I like this, this one uh, saying by Winston Churchill where he says, the farther backward you can look, 
the farther forward you are likely to see. As mentioned before, one of the traits we share as human beings is that we assume that our own experience is a true and proper base from which to view the rest of the world. For example, when we're healthy, we presume that those we meet are healthy and judge them by that standard. When we're sick, we're more likely to wonder if others are sick as well. It goes even to very trivial areas. When you drive a Ford, you see Fords on the road. We assume what the leaf of our existence defines the rest of the world. Tolkien began his famous novel, The Hobbit, with these words. In a hole in the ground, there lived a hobbit. Now, you all remember Bilbo Baggins lived in a comfortable home in the Shire, a small, peaceful village that celebrated gardening, community gatherings, and a meal schedule that included breakfast, second breakfast, elevencies, lunch, afternoon tea, supper, and dinner. I envy the schedule. <laughs> Bilbo was quite content with the leave of his life. And it was beautiful for that. But little did he know of the twigs, the branches, the trunks, and the roots that were all around him. Little did he know of distant towers, trolls, and talking trees. The farther he went from the comforts of the Shire, the more remarkable and strange the world became. While Tolkien's world was one of fiction, it can serve as a metaphor for our own experience. I grew up in a small branch of the church in Zwickau, East Germany. Our little meeting house was a beautiful building with an old air-driven organ. And it was one of my privileges to sometimes have the assignment to work the bellows that supplied air to the pipe organ. While the congregation sang our beloved hymns of the Restoration, I pumped with all my strength so the organ would not run out of the wind. The eyes of the organist unmistakably indicated whether I was doing fine or needed to increase my efforts quickly. I loved our little meeting house with its stained glass window. It was kind of an old villa. And uh, in these glass windows, stained glass windows, uh, there was um, Joseph Smith kneeling in the sacred grove. When I was young, I supposed that this was what the church looked like that what I was seeing in Zwickau was what every other member of the church saw during their Sunday experience throughout the world. That the little leaf of my experience was the same as everyone else's. As I grew older, our family moved to Frankfurt where the church was a little larger. There were more members there. The meeting house looked different. The older I get, and the older I got, the more exposure I had to the church in its many forms throughout the world. And we saw the dresses of these wonderful children here. They represent the different representations. Not everyone who goes to church on Sunday looks like we look on Sunday. It is a different world, but it has a lot of things, and the more, most important things, the core things, in common. I have worshipped with the saints of God in congregations throughout the world, from the most humble of homes to the great conference center in Salt Lake City, where we are right now. Now, it is approaching almost seven decades since that small child sat behind the organ, pumping wildly, trying to force enough air through it, its pipes so that the congregation could hear the beautiful music. 
I have seen the church leaf, twig, branch, trunk, and root. And though outwardly the church appears differently, in the various areas of the world, I can affirm that it is of the same spirit and the same essence wherever you go. It rests upon the foundation of the blessed Redeemer and it's guided by the rock of revelation. No matter how different the church may appear in its outer form, wherever you travel, the inner spirit of Christ is the same in every congregation. And that is how it should be. I stand in awe of how the Holy Spirit transforms the lives of individuals regardless of their cultural, economic, or social background and leads all mankind to forsake the natural man and cleave to the light, to feel the mighty change that comes to those who seek God's truth. I've met men, women, and children on every continent who have experienced this transformative rebirth in their hearts, causing them to have no more disposition to do evil, but to do good continually. And you are part of these wonderful individuals. Oft times, it is not the wise nor the great who respond to the words, to the words of the prophets and the missionaries, but the poor in heart, the humble, and those who suffer. Frequently, these are they who approach their own hill Oneida in humility, in willingness to learn, and open their hearts to the word of God, and arouse their faculties to exercise a particle of faith, even if they can only muster no more than a desire to believe. Sometimes all it takes is the smallest seed. And many of us have that same experience in our lives. Merely a desire to believe for faith to sprout, blossom, and become good. Sometimes we must go to the Father, to our Father in heaven, in earnest prayer, tears wetting our cheeks as we repeat the words the distraught father offered to the gentle Christ. I do believe. Help my unbelief. From small seeds, great trees grow. From small beginnings, the Lord can work miracles in our lives. Our Heavenly Father is able to make great things come from small beginnings. In fact, this is often his preferred strategy. Case in point, I invite you to consider the small Galilean town of Nazareth. And you scholars of history and of the gospel will see in your um, inner eye this little town. Why do you suppose our Heavenly Father chose to have his only begotten son raised in this relatively insignificant town in Galilee? Why Nazareth? Why not Jerusalem or Rome for that matter? The Jewish convert to Christianity, Alfred Edersheim, wrote of this area that there was a general contempt in rabbinic circles for all that was Galilean, and that Galilean fool was a common and well-known expression. The town of Nazareth is not mentioned in the Old Testament, nor does Josephus, who spoke of many places in this area, speak of it. I understand that 
The Talmud lists 63 Galilean towns, but does not mention the city of Christ's youth. When Nathanael first heard of Jesus, he voiced a question that must have been on many of inquirers' lips. Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? And yet, from this small, out-of-the-way town came the light of the world, the savior of all mankind, our master, the redeemer of whom I bear witness, of whom I know that he lives and leads this church in this time and in our season of life. Now, 18 centuries later, in another small, out-of-the-way town, lived a young man who walked into a grove of trees near his home with a question in his heart. He knelt in prayer to ask God for direction in his life. Now, Palmyra was nestled in upstate New York, far from the intellectual and cultural centers of the United States, let alone the world. Why would our Heavenly Father choose such an out-of-the-way place to reveal himself to man? From these two unlikely, and disregarded places, Nazareth and Palmyra, emerged two figures who would change the world. Throughout the record of sacred history, we find that our Heavenly Father teaches His children over and again not to place their trust in the wisdom of the world, not to overvalue what the world holds in high regard. He teaches us that the foolishness of God is wiser than man and that the weakness of God is stronger than man. And yet, we have an almost irresistible desire to assume that the leaf of information we have in our possession is a representation of all there is to know. We assume that the horseradish that we see all around us is proof that the world is made of the same substance. We do the best we can with the information at our disposal to make assumptions and increase the body of knowledge. And this is, of course, a noble pursuit. However, when we assume that what we know is all there is to know, we miss the mark and our philosophies and theories fall short of the rich truths that populate heaven and earth. In the words of Orson F. Whitney, an early apostle of the church, the gospel embraces all truth, whether known or unknown. It incorporates all intelligence, both past and perspective. No righteous principle will ever be revealed. No truth can possibly be discovered, either in time or in eternity, that does not in some manner, directly or indirectly, pertain to the gospel of Jesus Christ." End of quote. Our Heavenly Father teaches this lesson to His children over and over again. He warns against setting aside the knowledge of God or dismissing its importance. He teaches us that we should not assume that what we know, what we can prove and test and verify is all there is. Now, let me quote another verse which you all know very well. We believe all that God has revealed, all that he does now reveal, and we believe that he will yet reveal many great and important things pertaining to the kingdom of God." End of quote. God sees infinitely more than we do, even in our time of internet and Google search and whatever. He knows more. His perspective is infinitely more complete and profound than ours. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, 
so are his ways higher than ours and his thoughts than ours. Now, he has much more information than we do. And a little more information can make all the difference in the world already. Since, as you know, English is not my native language, I enjoy looking into meaning of individual words, even plain ones. Take the word plain, now spelled differently. <laughs> now spelled P-L-A-N-E. And take another word, plain, spelled exactly the same way. But both words have the same amount of letters and they sound just the same. Nevertheless, there are huge differences between them. One is a handy tool for smoothing planks of uneven wood. The other is an infinitely better choice for transoceanic travel. <laughs> and I could go into that topic, but I won't. <laughs> a small amount of additional information and perhaps a bit of context makes a wondrous difference in our capacity to understand the meaning of words and the meaning of life's circumstances. In our world today, we often seek out the wise, the wealthy, and the well-known. We honor their opinions and follow their research. Compare that with how our Heavenly Father operates. He often chooses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. Now another quote. And if men come unto me, I will show unto them their weakness. I give unto men weakness that they may be humble that is teachable. And my grace is sufficient for all men that humble themselves before me. For if they humble themselves before me and have faith in me, then will I make weak things become strong unto them. Behold, I will show unto the Gentiles their weakness, and I will show unto them faith, hope, and charity will bring them unto me, the fountain of all righteousness." End of quote. Isn't that a practical and wonderful truth? God uses the weak and insignificant to bring to pass his work. He gently reminds us that the things which are despised hath God chosen that no flesh should glory in his presence. His knowledge of truth is so infinitely greater than ours that he looks upon the wisdom of the world as perhaps we might look upon the dogmatic assertions of a pedantic fool. And it doesn't matter in which area someone is a pedantic fool. Though the fool may speak words with passion and conviction, he may lack essential information. We must not abandon God's revealed truth, which cometh from the roots and source of all righteousness and truth. For what we see, in contrast, <clears throat> is the truth of our leaf. Frederick the Great, or Friedrich der Große, as we say in German, the 18th century King of Prussia, was one of the most innovative and successful military strategists in history. But he was not always successful. After his defeat at Kunersdorf, many of his soldiers widely scattered in confusion. The story is told 
that one soldier was brought before the king who asked him why he had run away. And the soldier said, because things were going badly for your majesty. Frederick reflected for a moment then said mildly, I suggest that you wait a week, then if things are still going badly, we will quit together. I think there's a lesson in this. There will be times when it may appear that things are going badly for the truth of God, that the evidence of the world contradicts God's utterances. For my part, I have learned to be patient, knowing that in the end things will work out. God's kingdom will continue to grow. It is his work. He will succeed. The truth will continue to flourish and spread throughout the earth. Sometimes all it takes is a little faith and a little more patience. Stay calm and carry on. That is a good counsel at times. Things which may appear impossible now may become matter of fact in years to come. Now let me share with you a, a personal experience that illustrates that. You are all well aware that in 1961 the uh, communist regime of um, East Germany began building a wall that could, would cut off the city of West Berlin from the surrounding area. This wall was a symbol of the Cold War and served as a metaphor for the separation and division of the communist world and the democratic Western world. One of the resulting side effects of this increased isolation was that it became increasingly difficult for members of the church in East Germany to visit the Swiss temple, the only temple in Europe at that time. Seven years later, in 1968, Elder Thomas S. Monson, an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, visited the saints in the German Democratic Republic, the DDR. And I'm sure you've heard President Monson talk about this. Now let me quote what President Monson said at his visit. On a cloudy and rain-filled day, I journeyed to the city of Görlitz, situated deep in the DDR near the Polish and Czech borders. I attended my first meeting with the saints. We assembled in a small and ancient building. As the members sang the hymns of Zion, they literally filled the hall with their faith and devotion. And he continues, my heart was filled with sorrow when I realized the members had no patriarch, no wards or stakes, just branches. They would and could not receive temple blessings, either endowment or ceilings. No official visitor had come from the church, from church headquarters for a long time. The members could not leave their country, yet they trusted in the Lord with all their hearts. And President Monson continues, I stood at the pulpit and with tear-filled eyes and a voice choked with emotion, I made a promise to the people. If you will remain true and faithful to the commandments of God, every blessing any member of the church enjoys in any other country will be yours. End of quote. And he says, then I realized what I had said. That night, I dropped to my knees and pleaded with my Heavenly Father, Father, I'm on thy errand. This is thy church. I have spoken words that came not from me, but from thee and thy son. Wilt thou fulfill the promise in the lives of this noble people? End of quote. Well, six years later, in 1975, President Monson returned to the Democratic Republic. He went to a beautiful place high above the Elbe River near Dresden and Meissen and rededicated the East German mission for the advancement of God's work. I quote from his prayer. 
Grant, Heavenly Father, that the membership here may receive their patriarchal blessings and live in such a way as to bring the promises to fulfillment. Heavenly Father, wilt thou open up the way that the faithful may be accorded to the privilege of going to thy holy temple, there to receive their holy endowments and be sealed as families for time and for all of eternity." End of quote. And the dedicatory prayer continues with the most wondrous pronouncement, and I encourage you, if you haven't read it yet, Please uh, do, I recommend it to you earnestly. President Monson concludes his, his prayer. Amidst the ringing of church bells this morning and the singing of birds in this, the forest which thou hast created, music fills our souls and gratitude fills our hearts as we humbly acknowledge before thee that thou art our Father, that with thee all things are possible, and the, thy gospel has been restored upon the earth. Grant that the way may be cleared for the program of the church in its fullness to come to this people, for they through their faith have merited such blessings. As thy humble servant, he said, Acknowledging the divine revelation and inspiration of this day, I therefore invoke thy holy blessings upon thy work and upon the, thy people in the Dresden mission of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. That's what he said. End of this quote. When I first learned about these wonderful promises by a prophet of God, my heart filled with gratitude to the Lord. But at the same time, I had an encroaching feeling of uncertainty, almost unbelief. There seemed no, no possible way, no possibility that these beautiful promises to our people could happen in their lifetime, if ever. How could a temple be built and operated in East Germany I had faith in the Lord, and I loved and acknowledged President Monson as a prophet, seer, and revelator. I wanted the saints in that country to have the full blessings of the gospel, but at the moment I just couldn't see a way why and how this could be accomplished. I grew up in East Germany. That's where my family joined the church. Harriet's ancestors come from the same part of Germany. We wished these promises to be fulfilled, but we knew firsthand of the challenges in our country. Was it possible to receive these promised blessings at a time of great political and societal division and isolation at the time of the Cold War? I felt somehow like the man who cried out, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. It was clear to me that the evidence of the world contradicted the word of an apostle of the Lord. Now, almost a decade later, almost 10 years later, Herod and I had all but forgotten this prophetic promise. We were attending the Swiss temple one day, accompanying a new married couple in their first time at the temple. When Harriet overheard a conversation between two elderly sisters from East Germany. The elderly at the time were the only ones in the DDR who were allowed to travel to the Swiss temple as the regime back then felt sure and secure that these elderly people were no flight risk. One of these elderly sisters was talking to her friend about a very strange message she had received the same morning. Her son had informed her that soon a temple would be built in the DDR, the German Democratic Republic. Harry told me about it and said that this poor sister must have been very confused or lost her mind over the continuous wishful thinking to have a temple in East Germany. We felt sorry for these sisters. 
but also were quite amused at the same time when we shared the same episode with our friends. There wasn't even a temple in West Germany. How could the church build one in the DDR? A few days later, the Freiburg Temple was announced. In June of 1985, President Gordon B. Hinckley dedicated in East Germany the Freiburg Temple as a house of the Lord. It was the first temple behind the Iron Curtain, a temple in a communist land that almost everyone, including me, had said would never be possible in our lifetime. The construction of the Freiburg Temple is one of the great miracles in the history of the Church in Europe. It's a wonderful example of how God can make the impossible possible in any part of the world. Now, when you look at the world today where we have temples, who would have thought about the many temples we're receiving in Africa or in other places in the world? The lesson here is an important one. God knows what we do not. What may seem impossible for us is not impossible for him. What we mortals may write off as foolishness may be entered in the book of heaven as fact. God is good and faithful, and he performs his work in ways that sometimes are not comprehensible to our mortal minds. He asked that we have a little faith, a little patience, that we believe. He asked us to seek after him and believe in his word. It is my conviction that those who disregard the reality of heaven will ultimately find themselves on the wrong side of history. And that is true for any issue even the issues we're struggling with today. I assume that all of you love to study history. Talking to you about the importance of history or the keeping of records would almost appear like taking owls to Athens or carrying coal to Newcastle or selling snow to Eskimos. They have plenty of it this year. As a slight variation of what I said at the beginning, let me add, those who don't study history are doomed to repeat it, and those who do study history are doomed to stand by helplessly while everyone else repeats it. <laughs> As you know, on April 6, 1830, just the date again, April 6, 1830, a very significant revelation was given to Joseph Smith, the prophet, at Fayette, New York. The revelation was given at the organization of the church and the home of Peter Whitmer, Sr. Six men who had previously been baptized participated. By unanimous vote, these persons expressed their desire and determination to officially organize the church. In this revelation, one half sentence has great significance for our discussion today. It reads, Behold, there shall be a record kept among you. This is why we have a church recorder. Almost five years later, in February of 1835, Joseph Smith, met with nine members of the Twelve of, and placed before the Council, and I quote, an item which would be of importance, end of quote. He told them that he had learned something from experience that gave him deep sorrow. Then he said, and I quote, it is a fact that if I now had in my possession every decision we had made upon important items of doctrine and duty since the commencement of this work, I would not part with them for any sum of money. But we have neglected to take minutes of such things, thinking perhaps 
that they would never benefit us afterwards, which, if we had them now, would decide almost every point of doctrine which might be agitated. But this has been neglected, and now we cannot bear record to the church and to the world of the great and glorious manifestations which have been made to us with that degree of power and authority we otherwise could if we now had these things to publish abroad." End of quote. That's what Joseph said. Joseph Smith then urged the members of the Twelve to keep records of important events and decisions. He said that if they would do this, even with items that may seem to have little or no worth, that later they would find them of infinite worth, not only to your brethren, but they will be a feast to your own souls. Now, with this being emphasized by the Prophet Joseph, I thank you, every one of you, for your efforts you are making to record the history of the Church and its people. Sometimes we feel that our lives are mundane and trivial. Of what interest would my life be to anyone, we might say. And I think we all have said that at a certain time in our life. Those of you who are deeply involved in the recording and teaching of history can answer that question far better than I. You understand the worth of journals that may have seemed trivial and mundane to the people who wrote them at the time but are cherished and treasured years later. I commend you for all you do to keep a history of the Church and for your efforts in encouraging others to keep a record of their lives and their families. This is a cause that is of great importance to God's work and to His Church. I am indeed grateful for the marvelous work that is being done to prepare and publish the Joseph Smith Papers. Learning about the real struggles and real successes of early Church leaders and members is a very faith-promoting process for me. We always need to remember that transparency and openness keep us clear of the negative side effects and measures being followed after by the world of secrecy or the cliché of faith-promoting rumors. Jesus taught the Jews, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Truth and transparency complement each other. As we know, the glory of God is intelligence, or in other words, light and truth. My dear brothers, my dear sisters, one of the most fascinating things about this mortal experience is that there is so much to learn. Isn't it a remarkable feeling to belong to a church that not only embraces truth, no matter the source, but that teaches there's much more to come, that God will yet reveal many great things and important things pertaining to the kingdom of God. As a result, we are humble about the truth we have. We understand our knowledge is a work in progress, that the leaf we have before us is simply one microscopic snapshot, part of an infinitely vast forest of fascinating knowledge. Our little world, our small section of experience, may be an accurate and true reflection of our reality, <clears throat> but it is only an infinitesimal atom in the vast universe of what we eventually will know. Isn't that exciting? Isn't that a glorious concept? Isn't it wondrous to belong to a church that teaches that infinite progress and eternal knowledge await those who set foot upon the path of discipleship of Jesus Christ and follow it in faithfulness and in dedication? Well, my dear brothers and sisters, I wish you the best in this noble effort 
as you pursue the great adventure of recording and clarifying history. The roads we travel are certainly not guaranteed to be easy or ever blessed. But if we keep traveling in the pursuit of truth, they will always lead back to the ultimate truth. They will lead us to our Heavenly Father, who is the great historian, the great record keeper, the great creator, the mentor, and our friend. Of this I testify with all my heart and soul, and I leave you my blessing as an apostle of the Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Master, amen.